talk. You are aware of um, our special guest today. Her name is Piper Kerman. She's the author of the memoir, Orange is the New Black. Um, and we are thrilled to have her here with us. Um, there is a bio in your booklet that um, describes her background, her work with Spitfire um, strategies, and her work on the board of the, Pri the Women's Prison Association. Um, you can read more about it there. Um, we're going to do a Q&A with Piper, talk a little bit about um, the book, what led her to her current work, her advocacy, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So um, the first question, Piper, is just in terms of the book, what your thinking was. Did you have a specific agenda when you wrote the book? Um, what was your intention in terms of what the outcomes might be? OK. Um, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here with both of you. And thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that lunch. Uh, the book, uh, I came home from prison in 2005. I had just served 13 months for a crime that I had committed uh, more than a decade before, a nonviolent first-time drug offense, uh, which is what we lock many millions of people up for in this country. Um, and despite the fact that I had committed a crime, that I had uh, been policed, which is very unusual for a white middle-class person, uh, that I had been prosecuted and sentenced, and done my time, um, what I found is that the experience was incredibly different than everything that I assumed that it would be based on what we all sort of think we know about prisons and about criminal justice and about how the court systems work um, and what is happening behind the walls of a prison. So literally the first day of prison, uh, I went to bed that night exhausted and overwhelmed and completely unsure that I would survive that year. But still, I went to bed that night and said, this is clearly going to be really different than what I thought it was going to be. And that was true. You know, um, The women that I was incarcerated with were overwhelmingly there for nonviolent offenses. Some of them were serving exceptionally long sentences, especially in comparison with mine. I had a 15-month sentence. I served 13 months. Um, the women that I did time with, the majority of them had had access to none of the sort of very basic middle class privileges that I had had in my life, like a safe, safe and stable place to live, uh, a good public education, mm -hmm. a college education, health care, those kinds of things. So I came home and those women had made such a powerful impact on me through their friendship, through helping me survive, through sharing their own survival with me, um, that it was uh, from the day that I walked out of prison, I knew that there was no way I could ever walk away from that experience. Over the course of the, my reentry, you know, many people were, were like, tell me about prison. Uh, and I would tell them about prison. And they would come to it with really polarized um, misconceptions or, pre or pre prejudices about prison and about criminal justice. So people would say, oh, you must have been beaten up every single day, which is, of course, not true. Or people said, oh, a federal facility, it must have been pretty much a country club, right? Also not true. So, and when I had long engaged conversations with people about my experience and the other women that I had the time with, they were fascinated and they were surprised and they were frequently outraged. And so, I was encouraged to write about my experience. When I did write, I was encouraged to write more. And that was, that was a strong encouragement. And ultimately, I sort of felt like talking about my own story and sharing my own experience held the possibility to get people to read a book about prison who would not otherwise read a book about prison. Mm -hmm. So from the very first point of debating whether to write the book or not, I knew that I wanted to reach outside of the choir, outside of the family of people who have been incarcerated and their families and their communities who are so familiar with our enormous criminal justice system in this country and the prison system. And I wanted to reach further outside. I basically wanted to expand the choir. And so that was the approach that I brought to writing the book. Um, in order to do that, I think I very consciously was like, I'm writing a pop culture book, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. 
Um, and, and I was very, very fortunate. I was fortunate to work with a great editor at Random House, a very mainstream publisher, who was able to get it out in a very mainstream way. And that's what I want, is for criminal justice reform to be recognized as a mainstream issue, because there's 65 million Americans with criminal convictions in this country. So it is not a fringe question by any stretch of the imagination. That's a long answer. <laughs> but, a very good but, it, one. but it's an important one because I think there are a lot of folks in the room who have been working on criminal justice reform for a long time. But your book, the series, has really touched a nerve. And I think you've succeeded because it's gone beyond you know, mm -hmm. those very close circles of people who are looking at reform into a public conversation mm -hmm. about the criminal justice system that really hasn't taken place in a long time. Mm -hmm. So what's the role of culture in all this? Same with Mark's you know, film. How how does culture sort of tap into that in a way that all of us talking about these issues for years and years and years, don't, does, they don't do? Well, culture is incredibly, incredibly important. You know, there were cultural currents, there are cultural currents that have contributed over the last 30 years to us building up the biggest prison population in the world, by far the biggest prison population in human history, actually. No, no society has ever incarcerated so many of its people as the United States does. Um, anyone here who has read Michelle Alexander's phenomenal book, The New Jim Crow, which was published the same year that my, and you know, I think the same spring that my book was published, um, knows and recognizes that a huge current of that buildup has been the exploitation, the targeting, the exploitation, and the control of poor communities of color. Um, and there are all kinds of cross of cultural currents that made that possible, right? that made sort of state violence against and state control of poor people of color a continuing you know, policy in this country, a continuation building off of slavery, building off of the first round of Jim Crow, um, you know, this, the conclusion of the sort of mid-century civil rights movement, and then this is a reactionary you know, backswing. Um, so culture plays a really big role, which is why it's important to fight back with culture. Um, really important. I think that, I mean, one of the things that was true for, around my choices to write the book and I think the reaction to the book um, that is a conundrum or a, just something to recognize about culture and the question of who you need to persuade, right? Mm -hmm. Who do you need to persuade to get on board with the changes that you want to see? So who do you need to persuade to get people on board with the changes that, you need, that you're all funding and the changes that you're seeking, which are big changes, right? Big, audacious, bold changes. So, you know, to combat mass incarceration, you know, that point that I made about getting people who wouldn't otherwise read a book about prison, mm -hmm. I knew from the jump that that, you know, my race, my class, the blondest of my gender, all of those things would contribute to getting people to read this story and to engage with that story. In other words, the fact that it was a quote unquote fish out of water story that we don't expect upper middle class white women to ever be in prison was going to be a big part of the hook of why people would read it. But that is of course a very complicated thing when you have a criminal justice system and especially a prison population which is so overwhelmingly disproportionately filled with people of color, and especially poor people of color. So, you know, that idea that you need personification associated with your issues. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you want to get, if you want to make your issues into mass issues, and if you really want to get outside of the choir and get a lot more people on board with the things that you're funding and the ways that you want your issues to be going, you do need personification. It was fascinating to hear the previous panel because I do think that um, while we think of digital organizing as, ver as very sort of, you know, big numbers, it is also very personalized and personified. Like, I'm a, I adore Twitter, and Twitter is very personalized, right? The, the most um, successful Twitter feeds and the most successful use of Twitter is often built around a personality and not necessarily an organization, right? Um, or an ent you know, a, a, a more faceless entity. But that question of like who personifies your issue, and there's never one single person or one single story that can explain complicated issues. 
but you do need a mosaic of human beings, people who carry the story forward. And that's something to think about as funders, because you need to be investing in those people and their work, and you need to be investing in the organizations that sort of foster and nurture more of those stories into the culture, and especially popular culture. So Piper, the criminal justice system is not the only thing that the book has lifted up. Um, with, in terms of the characters, the whole issue of transsexuals has really, with um, Laverne Cox uh, taking on that role, mm -hmm. it really has just become um, quite visible mm -hmm. in the media. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about your thinking when you were writing the characters and if that also was deliberate in thinking about how po popular culture would perceive um, that character. That's a really interesting mm -hmm. question. I love, love Laverne. I mean, that, speaking of personification, right? That She's just amazing. proves yep. this point even more. So the, uh, the history of uh, that character being brought into the show and Laverne personifying that character so incredibly beautifully is that while I was incarcerated, there was a transgendered woman who was incarcerated with me um, who is called Vanessa in the book. And she uh, is an amazing person and was my next door neighbor, literally meaning she lived right there. Yeah, <laughs> like, hey, hey, Vanessa. Um, and when I first sat down to try to write about the experience, I had not decided to write a book. I was just being encouraged, like, write about this. You've been home for prison for less than a year. You know, you, maybe you have some issues to work out. <laughs> um, I thought, what will I write about? What would I want to tell someone about? And so I wrote about my first day in prison, because I thought, you know, most people would be interested in that. And you know, that's a way for people to imagine themselves in those shoes. Mm -hmm. Scary. And I wrote about the federal airlift, and I wrote about my experience in a federal jail, because it was horrible. And I wrote about being brought face to face with my ex-lover in prison, because that was interesting, and at times horrible. But, um, but one of the thing, but the other topic that I chose to write about was Vanessa and Vanessa's presence in that prison unit. And I wrote about, I mean, I just sort of that, I just went with my gut on that because Vanessa in her own right is a fascinating person. And more importantly, the response of that community to her presence there was really, really interesting both in terms of the other prisoners and certainly in terms of the way that the staff and the institution responded to her presence there. So right from the beginning of writing the book, that was sort of, she was a central or important figure. And it didn't surprise me a bit that Genji Cohan, when she chose to adapt the book into the show, I fully expected that she would create, she would adapt that character into a transgendered character. Mm -hmm. and I fully expected that she would cast a transgendered actor in that role, because if you know Genji, you would expect the exact same thing. There would never be a question in your mind. So it is this fascinating thing about, you know, when is the right person in the right place at the right time, right? And that's Laverne. And thank God for that. I mean, the, the response to her is astonishing. And that's I speak amazing. on college campuses often. And Laverne and I always joke that we are crisscrossing each other's path because she also <laughs> speaks on college. I, I feel like every campus I go to, they're either, they either say, oh, Laverne was just here, or Laverne's coming next semester. We're so excited. But it's the same question that, uh, you know, in terms of um, the moment in time that is the right time for me to publish, you know, for my story. Because, you know, advocates in the field of criminal justice reform have been working on these issues as long as mass incarceration has been going on. And communities of color have been advocating on these issues vigorously for decades. And so these questions of sort of power and power imbalances and the right voices at the right time and what sort of breaks through and, create and, and attracts more attention and attracts more energy is an important question for, for either philanthropies to think through or to uh, make sure that your grantees are thinking about those questions. It's great. So the issues you're most passionate about because I know you've been traveling, as you said, around the country, speaking to college campuses. And um, you've got the attention on you right now between the book and the series. What issues for you are what you're most passionate about in terms of reform? And how is that playing out mm -hmm. as you travel around the country and talk to folks? Yeah. Uh, for me, the name of the game is always uh, putting fewer people into prison or jail 
and whenever possible, putting fewer people into the criminal justice system. So in a, there's, a, there's the issue of a conviction, and then there's the question of confinement. Um, it is really hard for people to come back from confinement, um, and especially the fact that the vast majority of prisoners lack the advantages that all of us in the room you know, have. Uh, in terms of education, in terms of access to capital, in terms of safe housing, health, et cetera. So not putting per people into confinement, not putting people into criminal j uh, uh, prisoner jail is to me the name of the game. And also, like being saddled with a felony conviction, even if you don't get locked up, is also incredibly burdensome in terms of access to public benefits, in terms of the rights of parenthood in terms of so many rights. We have really created an incredible array of collateral consequences to a felony conviction, regardless of confinement. Um, the federal, the White House, uh, White House organized a sort of reentry and employment um, hootenanny uh, this summer. And you know, the, some of the researchers who were working on that estimated that there are 42,000 statutes on the books that limit employment for people who have mm -hmm. a criminal conviction, which is insane uh, when you have so many people who have been criminalized. So to me, that's the number one thing, putting people, fewer people in prison, putting fewer people into the system in the first place. People really want to talk about what they describe as prison reform. So having our prisons no longer be incredibly harsh, sometimes savage, sometimes just incredibly um, unproductive places where people's civil rights and human rights are routinely violated. I'm with that. I'm down with that. But I still feel like the name of the game is putting fewer people in prison in the first place. Mm -hmm. Having said that, prison conditions and the idea that perhaps one day in this country we will have prisons and jails that do fulfill some sort of rehabilitative function is worth it. I mean, that's worth it to see. And there are some examples out there, few and far between, of correctional facilities or sometimes correctional systems which are trying to do better. Um, but it's hard to do that when you have prisons and jails which are filled to overflowing with human beings. Most prisons and jails are far, far, far over their capacity. So in defense of corrections folks, it is really hard to do anything but maintain order when that is true. Mm -hmm. um, however, one of the things that I am always willing to speak out on is the use, the overuse, and the abuse of solitary confinement. Because it is, there are about 80,000 people estimated to be in solitary confinement in this country. It is the harshest pr punishment we have in this country other than a penalty of death. 10 days in solitary confinement for a healthy person will cause rapid mental, emotional, physical deterioration. And a huge number of the people who are put into solitary confinement are mentally ill and not healthy. And so uh, it, you know, solitary confinement for any length of time is torture, and it ha is happening in every prison and jail in this country. So um, yeah. yeah, I got, I don't know, I, I was so de uh, depressed about watching the election results last night. I turned on PBS, and they had a whole documentary on solitary confinement. So I don't know if I would, but by wait. the end of it, I was I almost wanted to put back on MSNBC after that. <laughs> but wait, but wait, it. you turned off the TV too soon because Prop 47 in California That's passed right. yesterday. Yeah. You know, and, and all of you who are familiar with the bizarre aspects of California politics know that that was Californians going to the ballot and deciding that. So, uh, you know, as much as we could talk about solitary confinement and all want to fall into a hole in the ground, but what I will say is that over the last 10 years, the pendulum swing is happening in terms of moving away from many of the ter terrible, terrible public policy um, decisions that have been put in place. Now, so something like I think 29 states have passed some form of criminal justice you know, reform through their legislators, their legislations. Now, um, you know, some of those have been really tentative and extremely moderate. <laughs> uh, so to me, that really speaks to a need to push much, much harder to make sure that that momentum gains speed and really goes far in the right direction. And to me, that, I mean, that sort of brings back to, you know, sort of what are the most important things? There's sentencing reform. 
They, ought, you know, they do include improving the conditions of confinement, especially when terrible human rights abuses are in, are in play. Um, and the way that that's going to happen, in my opinion, I feel like when you go out there and you start talking to policymakers and you start talking to experts in the field and you talk to the academics, basically when you talk to elites out there in the country, what you will find is actually more consensus than you might expect in terms of, yeah, we have a really broken, screwed up criminal justice system and something should be done. But what you don't find is a high urgency. And so, you know, some of the polling that was done maybe two years ago, some of the public opinion polling indicated more and more agreement that having the biggest prison population in human history is probably not a good thing for the United States of America and for all Americans. But the question of like intensity is really important because that is the prioritization piece. That says, you know, when you go into 50 state legislatures, how are we going to make sure that the reforms are um, more audacious? How are we going to make sure that the reforms make it out of judiciary committees and, and you know, that the folks who are the bean counters say, oh right, of course we should do this. You know, and for that, you need grassroots organizing. You need community organizing. Because I believe that, you know, if you're talking in broad brush strokes, you know, there's a lot of conservative voices coming out for criminal justice reform mm -hmm. at this point in time. Differ in differing and varied motivations behind those voices, but still. Um, you're seeing more consensus around the idea that reducing our enormous prison population should be a priority, but you need to see a lot more heat to see that actually happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it happened, you know, this summer we, I spoke about the tour that we did um, in Texas and Arizona with a bunch of funders, and we ended up at Sheriff Arpaio's. It's not just Shocking. one jail. He has a complex of like eight different facilities all under, you know, in this huge campus. And when I was standing outside and looking at the tent, you know, city that he has prison with 110 degree temperature, and the guards, every time we asked a question, they said, well, the people of Arizona are okay with this. They're okay with chain gangs. They're okay, and I think you're right. It's not just the elites. I mean, if there isn't enough noise out there from people who are really pissed off about it or think it's outrageous, it's not going to happen. And honestly, at a certain point, you look at these guards and you're like, they're probably right. Well, no one's complaining. There isn't a public will saying chain gangs are bad or people being yeah. outside. More in important, a tent. Sheriff Arpaio won his last election right. and he's won many of his elections. So that's itself. where this organizing piece and the grassroots piece, and we, what we really need, in my opinion, is standing coalitions or you know groups in all 50 states that will come together around criminal justice issues again and again because there's myriad issues. There's things like elected officials, and those include judges, and those include prosecutors, and they include sheriffs. And you know there are great you know there's a great sheriff in Hampton County, you know Massachusetts, who is a total progressive. We need a lot more of him. And so you need you know those standing coalitions and those grassroots folks who are who have capacity and have the right experience and the right people on board to go in on those kinds of elections, to go in on legislative reform when it's moving. Um, and those folks will really change the culture in all 50 states. Or how, that's, that's the potential there. Good. Well, thank you so much. I think we're going to open it up Everybody's now. anxious. Oh, and sure. by the way, there is a season three being filmed. Piper told us she didn't tell us anything yeah. about what's going to happen. Robert tried, but I Robert tried to get out information of out of her. Robert Bray, but we weren't yes. successful. But there is a season. I three. will add, you know, sort of tagging on to uh, what the, the 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 end of the previous panel discussion. I just want to be like uh, an evangelist for right. failure. <laughs> uh, I obviously personify, you know, some huge personal failings and just really epic belly flops, and you know. And you, whether you're talking about an individual or whether you're talking about an organization, everyone learns far more from their failures than from their successes. Far, far more. And when I came home from prison, I, you know, I had the benefit of a professional life before I was incarcerated, but I had to re-enter my professional life. And I was scared. And I got a lot of second chances. You know, I, I had a friend who had a company, and he gave me a job when I came home. And I can't overstate how important that was. Mm -hmm. 
But I remember so vividly, there were a lot of things I had to do after I came home from prison that were scary in terms of things like getting up in front of rooms of like 80 to 100 people or you know, a variety of other things. But I always had what I describe as the trump card of failure. And that is, no matter how scared I was to do something, whether it was publish the book, or talk in front of a room of 100 people, or hand the book over to a woman I had only met twice and let her adapt it into God knows what, uh, I always said to myself, it can't possibly be worse than prison was, right? Mm -hmm. I had that epic failure to draw down on and say, the risks are worth it, right? So, OK, now questions. Questions. <laughs> Come on, guys. Hands up. All right. Who's going to call? You two have to call on them. All right. OK. Um, stand up? <laughs> yep. Hi. Um, Hi. First of all, my name is Gina Clayton. I'm so happy um, to hear you speak. And I, I've met you before, not that you would remember. But I'm in, LA, in, in San Francisco doing similar work. And my question is, you talk about how important it was to grab attention as a woman, as a, as a white woman with blonde hair. Mm -hmm. And if what you also say, which I also very much believe, is that communities need to have their own voice mm -hmm. in this movement. Yep. But that people, and they have, been, they have been working hard to get that voice mm -hmm. for as long as mass incarceration has been a problem. Mm -hmm. What then would you tell those communities or communities members, the, form, the formerly incarcerated people's movement, people who are directly impacted by these issues, how to capture public attention, how mm -hmm. to get into the mainstream? Mm -hmm. uh, I, you're, I met you at NCCD, correct? Yes, fabulous. I love your dress. <laughs> um, criminal justice reform, like many other, I think, reform efforts, requires two things. It requires the attention and investment and, and co cooperation and collaboration of elites. That's just realistic if you want to see near-term reform. And really to get the kind of criminal justice reform we want that is truly just and that will make a big difference, we need the communities that are most affected to have a much more elevated and amplified voice. And I'm sure that's true for, the other, for many other issues that you all are working on and funding. But it's certainly cr it's true for criminal justice reform. So um, I would say up until relatively recently, like the last 10 years, no one ever asked or cared what prisoners or former prisoners thought or felt or suggested about criminal justice systems, right? They would ask judges and policymakers and academics and they'd ask everyone, everyone around this individual or group of individuals who are at the heart of the question. That's really important. Um, I think the thing that is most important for anyone who is trying to gain more voice, you know, using personal stories or, or personalized stories, is that they must be really focused on the question of what is their communication going to accomplish? What is their communication intended to accomplish? So are, are you communicating with elites? Or are you fostering and building the voice of a community? That's a really intentional decision to know, like, what is this communication intended to do? What do I want this story to accomplish? Why am I telling it? And what result do I want? So that's first and foremost an intentional choice, because you'll tell the story in a different way, even if it's the same story, right? Uh, and so that question of audience is really, really, I think, at the heart. Because bearing witness to injustice is really important, but it's not always persuasive. Does that make sense? And that's unfortunate. That's sort of heartbreaking that that's the case, but it is. And so knowing whether what you're doing with your story and with what you're telling is about simply bearing, you know, when I say simply, bearing witness is very difficult, but bearing witness and simply making sure that your experience is part of the record, that it doesn't disappear, that it's not unacknowledged and un undocumented. Um, versus you know, uh, what you want to accomplish in a persuasion you know, paradigm. I think that's the really important thing for, frankly, all people who want to speak out on an issue, but especially for communities that have, have, uh, whose voices have been silenced or in communities that are marginalized. And you know, 
The thing about the criminal justice system is if you as funders have any concerns about marginalized communities, and there are many in this country, then you kind of have to be concerned about the criminal justice system because I don't care if you're talking about LGBTQ youth or people of color or you know uh, mentally ill people or you know health issues like substance abuse. Every group of folks who are pushed to the margins of our society are also being funneled into the criminal justice system. That has been our answer to many of these really challenging problems, and that's a big mistake. Great question. Other questions? Got up oh, right here. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, Piper. Um, Hi. First of all, thank you so much for writing that book. Sure. We're, we're huge fans of it in New Mexico. I work for the ACLU of New Mexico Regional Center for Women's Rights. I love the ACLU of New Mexico. <laughs> and There's an amazing women's law project in, in New Mexico yes. that works for women prisoners. Exactly. Great group. Yep. And uh, one group, one very marginalized group right now, unfortunately, and one of these people that are being confined are migrants and immigrants. And as you may know, uh, New Mexico has the distinction of opening up one of the a family detention center in Artesia, New Mexico, where, which I go to every other week. Mm. And for me, these women, they're not even part of the criminal justice system, really. They're all here seeking asylum, yeah. and yet they're all being detained, not just alone, but with children. And so we're actually detaining children now. Um, who have done nothing wrong but flee violence in their home countries. Yeah, and when you say detained, we're putting those children in prison. They're exactly. Like, let's, let's call they're, it, call they're it in what jail. it is. <laughs> they're locked up. And then there's um, one of the stunning things for us was when President Obama announced that they were asking as part of the supplemental budget request, he was putting in a request for 6,500 new beds. Mm. We're up to 4,000 when Dilly, Texas facility is, 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 closed, is, is finished. The question I have for you, though, is where does private prison uh -huh. corporations, yeah. where is their role in all of this, and how can we push back against that? Because we know that it's private prison corporations that are behind this. As crime rates go down, we're going after immigrants. We're going after LGBTQ community, et cetera. So mm -hmm. where, where do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, so if you're talking about criminal justice reform, then you got to say, follow the money. <laughs> And you don't build the biggest prison population in human history without building a lot of uh, profit and benefit into you know, that incredible human you know, situation. And so private prisons are the most obvious sort of prison profiteers um, because you know, there's a small handful of them, and they are, have been incredibly profitable, and they, they're rot, their existence maps mass incarceration in terms of you know, timeline and history. Um, and they are very powerful lobbyers, not only of the federal government, but also of state governments. And so you know, as grant makers, you know, you're investing in your fields, but what you also have to think about when you're making your, your grant making choices is where will the opposition come from? Not the persuadable, you know, not like people who we need to get on our side, but people who will never be on our side. <laughs> and so private prisons are a great example, but it's a much broader, you know, sort of uh, cast of characters if you want to talk about prison profiteering, because you also have companies like Corizon, which is the biggest provider of prison health care in this country, or Aramark, which provides food services to country, to, you know, not just to the stadium near your house, but also to prisons all over this country. And so any time that people are drawing benefit from the status quo, you have to think long and hard about how you can either, either get them to move off of that, uh, you know, you know what, what is your sort of field building and your movement building going to do to either move those people who profit from the status quo in a different direction for some reason, if you believe in incentives, or what is your grant making, what is, this move, what is movement building, what, is, what are those efforts going to do to challenge, and in this case I really think expose, because I think many, most Americans have never even heard of private prisons. Most Americans have no idea that private corporations provide such a huge percentage of things like prison health care and food and so on and so forth. So you have to bring sunlight and oxygen and daylight to some of those most, you know, if there's a situation uh, with your opposition, 
where it's something that is un unrealized, unnoticed, and shocking, then you have to bring sunlight. If it's something that's really out in the open, then you need to think about you know, what, what strategy is going to move folks away from that defense of the status quo. Because I do think, sort of back to some of the things we talked about before around what will create change and you know, that idea of having you know, 50 standing criminal justice coalitions in every single state, you know, a big part of their role will be combating the folks who profit most from the status quo. And in some states, that's, that's prison guards unions. And some, some states, that's like Arizona, overwhelmingly private prisons. Um, and yeah, and the intersectionality with other fields like immigration reform is also something to pay attention to and to, and to pool your resources and share your strength. Question back there, I see behind. You, sir. April. Oh, April. Back, no, she's got the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Piper. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is how does the policy of asset forfeiture complicate the incentive structure um, revol uh, around the issue uh -huh. um, of entrenched interest against prison reform? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and second, how do we create um, elite support for prison reform as an immediate issue um, rather than something that just needs to happen sometime maybe when they're not in office? Mm -hmm. Right, good question. So the asset forfeiture issue to which he alluded, if those of you who are not familiar with it, sort of carrying this idea of like who benefits from the status quo even further, there's, of course, it's easy to sort of point to the outside, like the, you know, the for-profit profiteers. But things like asset forfeiture are essentially when, when law enforcement has the ability to seize the property of private citizens and never give it back <laughs> um, as part of the existing law enforcement structure. And you see this happen both on large scale and also on very small scale, and there's actually a really amazing New Yorker article that makes it clear um, about you know sheriffs uh, simply relying so strongly on routine traffic stops to allow them to seize people's cars and people's property and you know and these and ordinary people have no way of fighting back on that. So the the larger point is that. People drawing benefit from the existing status quo is not simply about outside folks, but also about the inside game. Um, that's true when you want to talk about judges who in many parts of this country are elected and do things and must do things like raise campaign funds. Hmm. Um, and it's true when you talk about prosecutors who are also elected and it's true when you talk about sheriffs. You know, it's suddenly when you start to add it up, you're like, wow, there's a lot of electoral politics going on in the everyday business of law enforcement. So. Yeah, this is a tough one, <laughs> uh, shining a light on that. And the, and the idea that sort of the front end of the system before you ever get to prison or jail gates is actually where all the action is in terms of creating reform. I got to say that again and again and again. That's policing. I know you were talking about Ferguson before, you know, earlier. That's policing. That's courts. You know, that's the name of the game. Um, and of course, it's legislatures. So. I wish I had a really simple answer on that front end, but, but it, what the, the base, basic thing is that it deserves lots of attention and focus. And so policing is actually sort of easy in some ways just because cops are present in everyone's community and people have opinions about them, strong opinions, pro and con, uh, and their authority within the community, you know, abuses of authority are easily recognized. The courts are much more opaque and deserve much more attention and focus. Courts reform and communication about the incredible flaws in our court system, especially when it comes to judges and prosecutors and, and the sort of tattered, threadbare public defense system that we have. Um, those things all really deserve a lot of attention. So I forgot the second part of your question. I, about elevating. I was, oh, oh yeah. about elevating it among, among elites. Well, that, to me, comes, I mean, especially if you're talking about legislatures um, or county governments, because actually county governments are responsible for a huge amount of criminal justice policy and decision making. And you know, sort of the situation in Ferguson really exposed that in a way that was much more recognizable to many folks. Um, 
I think that really does come back to organizing com the community. And, and that's the communities that are mo most targeted and affected, but also bringing in a lot more people into that choir. Because those are the only folks that will ultimately create the pressure on elites to move off of just saying, yes, criminal justice reform should happen to criminal justice reform is one of my top three priorities. Right? Yeah. So without the voice of the people, it won't happen. Karen? Thanks. Um, given that the tidal wave that happened last night wasn't just Congress, but also a lot of state legislatures, mm -hmm. uh, but the surprising move of some conservatives to actually want to do what progressives would also agree is needed on some criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. where do you think the opportunities might be? I think the opportunities are definitely around what uh, the jargon within the field is the non non nons. So nonviolent, you know, nonviolent offenders, first time offenders, low level drug offenders, it, which is a huge swath of the prison population. So the federal prison population, 200, roughly 200,000 people locked up in the federal system, half of them are there for drug offenses that do not involve crimes of violence. Right? That's a lot. That's 100,000 people. And so, and in state systems, that tends to be about 25% of those systems. So that's sort of the rich opportunity for getting human bodies out of a bad system. The system reform, though, you know, you, you know, the the I don't know how many of you are from New York, but the uh, the head of Rikers Island just resigned, and two other of his sort of lieutenants, you know, also resigned, and that was um, exciting on some level. Uh, you know, to see really bad people leave control of that really bad place. But the truth of the matter is, like, putting different people in charge of bad systems doesn't necessarily improve the systems. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I think getting, however, getting some of these folks who really don't need to be incarcerated out of confinement and, and to whatever extent out of the system creates more breathing room for reform and for more thoughtful consideration. So I definitely think, I mean, just realistically on the nitty gritty, that's an opportunity. I think that, um, I think there are some opportunities around improving the conditions of confinement. I think that one of the most important one, and that affects recidivism and that affects reentry, basically. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about is a burgeoning movement around trying to make higher education more available within prisons. Because really, if you want to talk about a massive wasted opportunity, you know, you lock somebody up, you put them in prison, you put them to work, you know, scrubbing floors or doing electrical work or, you know, any number of things that you do as your prison job. Or, you know, maybe if you're really lucky, you get one of those unicorn jobs and you get to, like, you know, stitch things and earn a dollar an hour. But the idea that, uh, that, that jails and correctional facilities uh, essentially do virtually no educational work uh, other than required GED programs <laughs> is just a massive lost opportunity. Because what we see is that, of course, educational deficit is probably the number one predictor of being incarcerated, right? So when we fail <coughs> kids, when we fail children in the public school system, not all kids, but some of those kids will end up in very different kinds of institutions. And so that's, you know, I know some of you are working on school to prison pipeline work, and thank you very much for doing <coughs> that. I see so a we, final hand up in the back. I and think. that'll be our last question. <clears throat> thank you. Um, love the conversation. And I was just curious, because I loved your line about follow the money. And, but the other piece was related to, like, when you don't have, most of those prisons are often built in towns or areas where there's no other, other business. Yep. And so there's no other economic development. Yep. And so there's almost no incentive to get rid of the prisons because there's no other jobs for the people who work there and live there. And I'm just curious what you've been thinking about that, you know, the alternative sort of ways to utilize that kind of investment. And also, frankly, the way we do our census now is when you do census, you do census in prisons. Uh -huh. And the prison populations are usually from cities, but they're staying in rural areas, so yep. that's where the money comes. So. Yep, yep. This is all comes back to those state legislators and politics. Great example, tethering your question to this question, is here in New York. Uh, 
Governor Cuomo put forward a very modest proposal around uh, prison education, around public funds for prison education, and some of the upstate legislators who represent prison districts, districts where there are prisons, fought back. They didn't even have to fight back very hard before he totally folded. Uh, despite the fact that there are some incredibly successful prison, prison college programs here in New York State, really, really stellar ones. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think that thinking about how we talk about these issues in addition to how we organize, because no amount of talking substitutes for the organizing, right? Exactly, like it can never just be about sort of paradigm shifting conversations. Um, but the way I always ask people to think about these choices when it comes to public investment is that an investment in a prison or a jail is an inherently negative investment. You are basically doubling down on failure, as opposed to investing in a university or an art center or a, a, an amazing public library or a community health center or a hospital or all of the public institutions that we know make communities vibrant and prosperous and, oh, safe. Because when we look at communities that have those kinds of public institutions, which are positive investments of public dollars, we really tend to find that those communities um, are safe, are safe places. And when communities lack those kinds of public institutions, that's when we tend to find you know, that there's over-reliance, you know, a focus on criminal justice and a focus on incarceration and disproportionate incarceration when we have failed as a society to invest in the institutions that those communities need to be vibrant and safe and prosperous. So I always try to ask people to think about when you're putting money into a, a new jail or trying to keep a prison open that's, you know, I mean, in New York, we've really succeeded at reducing our prison population by more than 20%, which is fabulous. But, you know, some folks will battle to keep those institutions open. They are fundamentally, you know, negative investments. They're profoundly negative investments. So I, I ask people to sort of frame their thinking in that way. Because those communities, those upstate communities, deserve affirmative investments in things, in institutions which are going to give them benefit over the long term, but are not going to create this incredible drag on the state as a whole, for example. Well, Piper, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delightful.